Great. So welcome uh, to a talk um, that I'm mostly just uh, reporting about. So this is not my experience, but it could have been my experience. Um, so uh, this is genuine. So this is the uh, um, trying to chart the course through not knowing much about the uh, uh, SDK and, and how to develop a LibreOffice C++ extension, uh, so from, from zero to hero if you like, and, and perhaps some good experience there and also some lessons learned um, to share here. Um, good, so the, um, the background is this is um, a real customer project, um, so we were approached to build something well, we thought the, the, be the best fit would be a C++ uh, LibreOffice extension. And um, this is the story, um, how that went. Um, yeah, some exciting new tasks comes in. And uh, unfortunately, um, it involves some drivers uh, that uh, we, we need for that. And those drivers were only available for Windows and also the, the part of that, this being a hardware project, uh, was a proprietary software. So the decision to do that with LibreOffice um, was made and the decision to do it as an extension was made because of the, uh, the license challenges there. So we have some nicely separated uh, piece of software then that we just uh, link into LibreOffice. So with the MPL, LGPL license, that would be fine. Um, yeah, well, Windows, so um, the, uh, the person doing that uh, was not using Windows as a daily driver, so, so that added perhaps a little bit to the uh, challenges, but not substantially so. Um, yes, um, what was completely new, but it's always great to have some, uh, some guinea pigs, some, some experiment there with someone who did not do anything, but it's otherwise a smart cookie and experience with the community and LibreOffice uh, to try that out and then see how things are going and then take the feedback uh, and iterate. Um, right, so, and the whole thing started with the development setup because, hey, we're doing C++ here, so why not use LODE? Um, is that not the gold standard? Um, right, so what you do as a decent software engineer, you start reading the documentation. Um, just whom am I kidding? Of course you're not. Um, you just start hacking. So you just uh, open your editor, clone some Git repositories, and then you, you want to get going. And if you don't know what to do, then you ask Google or any other search engine of your choice um, how to get from A to B. Um, so, well, that went not super great. So the, the SDK examples, simply, in particular, the C++ ones simply didn't, didn't want to compile. And the, um, the documentation that was there at the obvious place, which is API LibreOffice.org, um, the instructions there were not working either. So neither the MinGW nor the Cyclone Make wouldn't do anything uh, properly. And then some other experiments were made and some iterations and some debugging ensued. And that was exactly, that, that, that matches exactly my own experience with the, uh, in particular, the, uh, the C++ and the Java part uh, of the SDK where you need to compile something that, um, and then, then I have some magic right up somewhere on my disk and, and some configure file that I tend to reuse since, since many years. And I forgot that, that I had it there. And I also forgot that I wanted to document that back in the day when I was going through that process for the first time. So I suppose many people uh, made that experience. One of the reasons uh, to have this talk here is to finally um, have it in the talk. So now we have like four places where somebody mentioned something about it. And of course, the, the obvious way then is not to make five places or six places out of it, but just one later. Um, right, so what was the fix then? Was the uh, SDK, set SDK and um, added the path there a little bit after figuring out how this was all playing uh, and interacting with each other uh, to finally get stuff going. So 
then we could compile the SDK examples. Um, yeah, th there was some some uh, some uh, interesting tweaks there with the Visual Studio um, command. So the let, let's say the shell inside Visual Studio, um, and um, yeah, I, I didn't know I didn't know that either. So if I would have been asked, I would have. Seen. I would have used some some Cyclone shell, or I would have used some some uh, some some DOS command shell um, for that. So, yeah, docs are documentation is wrong, an outrage, um, or are they? So the the, the problem actually was that um, that there was a duplication. So there were several places where those things were described. Um, and the assumption was simply wrong that the API would be the, um, the, the go-to place there or the, the canonical authoritative place, um, which, is, which is not implausible to assume given that it's, the, um, it's in, in the name and it also uh, has, has the, um, uh, the examples listed there and um, it's gen regenerated, so, so it's not, not at all implausible to assume that. Turns out, the go-to place would have been um, our development mentor's blog posts where he did exactly the same and had exactly the same experiment uh, experience and documented uh, what to do there and put it in a blog. Great stuff, like, like just, just absolutely um, cool, just that there was another place that was not adapted and so that was for better or worse popping up um, first thing on Google or for other reasons was, was selected. Um, so yeah, so that, um, that, that engineer was then devouring those blogs, being happy ever after, um, bookmarked the CMAG one for later because it's interesting stuff and probably makes life generally um, better with that MAG system, um, but at least the, the SDK was then building Take home message, well obviously um, wrong documentation is worse than no documentation because you never know if it's your fault or if it's the documentation that is, um, uh, that is at fault there. If you have multiple contradictory, contradictory documentations that is even worse than wrong documentations because you don't even know which documentation is closest to the truth, so it just massively explodes the complexity of the search space you then need to go through. And um, our, the LibreOffice project's SDK developer experience is still terrible. So, so, so if we want to encourage people to use the SDK for anything and not, be, and not, not lose 99 out of 100 people right there on the first day, then we really need to improve that. Um, and the silver lining, of course, is that great strides in progress was made. Um, and thanks to mostly Hossein and Ilmari there for actually going through that and documenting uh, their findings and improving things left and right. And feels a bit like last mile just, just needs a little bit of finishing touches and integration and cleanup. And then perhaps also again going through that process again, starting from zero, putting that, the obvious search, uh, asking the obvious search engine, see w where you end up, go through that process again, uh, rinse and repeat. So, yeah. So overall, I think, and that was, done in a matter of, I think, a day or two. So, so it's, not, it's not so bad. I, I, I had worse experience in the past um, when I was attempting it. And I was, of course, guilty as everybody else, not uh, turning what I experienced into positive action and, uh, and fixing things up. Uh, but what was the point, actually? So as, as I started um, in the beginning, started to say that there was an actual customer who wanted uh, a demo in LibreOffice under Windows with their specific hardware. That company is ILS Tech um, and they build hardware for massive demonstrations. So they, they build laser pointers and the camera device where you can 
essentially with, I don't know, 50 or 100 or 200 people in the room, everybody gets a laser pointer and then you can interact on a projector, um, on a screen, even in a planetarium like, like on the ceiling. The only thing that, that, that you need is line of sight between the, the wall or the, the, the screen or wherever the, the laser pointer points to um, and some little camera that kind of tracks where you actually are. So, right, and um, might be coming to a museum near you. So I hear that those uh, uh, miniature Wonderland people in Hamburg were interested in, uh, in having that. That's some, some model railway, very famous. If you're in Hamburg, go there, it's just awesome. Not, not because of this necessarily, but also. <laughs> So, so this is how it looks. Um, the, um, yeah, you can have a room, literally a room full of people, and it really works like with, with literally like, like 200 uh, uh, devices there. And in this case, this is, I think, some parliament, and I think that they're, they're picking the color of, the, of their uniforms or something, I don't know. <laughs> so, so what they wanted to, to do, they wanted to have a demo where you have multiple pointers. Um, so that you would have something like a teacher in the classroom would be able uh, to give their students to play with. And then they can, you can interact with the slides. You can have a poll, you can have a little game, you can do something, you can do some fun stuff or you can do um, educational stuff. And so to show that that works, well, we, 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 we choose uh, LibreOffice for that and Impress. Um, Right, so this is a bit of an explanation what the hardware can do, so that it's, it's a bi-directional, so you can also like uh, have a back channel, like you can have it, make it vibrate, you can have some LEDs flash there. Um, so right, so that, that's, the, that's the, the actual concrete um, uh, request uh, we, were, we were following there. The, the challenge, the um, beyond the fact it was in Windows, it, uses, it used some shared memory, so there was some um, the XY coordinates and also like which button was pressed. There was just a small shared memory area where we actually needed to poke at some bytes and, and read some status out. Well, it's not, not uh, unheard of like driver programming, hardware programming to do some bit banging there. So, so that was the, the, probably the most um, uh, straightforward implementation. Sadly, we had to port that to the C++, and of course, the, the easiest language then would have been um, C or C++ for, for having direct memory access, so, so we went with that, and not with Python or Java. Um, right, and you could use some, you could use your mobile phone, there was some, some emulation, uh, so you didn't need the actual the actual hardware. I, I planned to actually bring it here, um, but it didn't ship in time, so trust me on that. I had it in my hand already, it works. Um, you, right, and the idea was then, there was some interaction, have some strategy game, um, something exciting, something where something moves. Uh, there was, they also did some Unity-based uh, games there, some uh, like, um, uh, shoot them up, or I think some star field, something. Um, right. So, so then the uh, the idea was uh, developing, and the, um, what helped really for Impress that um, the engineer looking into that actually was the one who did the the physics engine. Uh, so taking this uh, together, and the fact it should have been an Impress was kind of a, a natural match there, um, because that... Sorry? Yes, you didn't know. <laughs> you, you will, there, there will be a video in a second, so you can... You can it's seeing is believing. So yeah, then um, let's see what, what that does. Um, the, what you see here, is um, uh, two slides. There was an extension that actually controls the, um, uh, the shapes there. So, so there's two pointers. One uh, controls the, the shape with the number one and the other with the number zero. And then you can, on the first slide, and you can uh, pick the bill you would be attacker or defense. This is the second slide. Now you can move your, your little token there. 
Um, yeah, this is literally an, an impress slide, and those are impress shapes. You see a few more shapes, you see a little bit more text there. Um, after both players have placed their bets, you press Shift F5, so which means start the slideshow on the current slide. It's all kind of demo, it just shows what is possible. It's not very polished, but it shows you what you can do with the SDK. So you can do pretty much everything in LibreOffice, including uh, mouse movements and interacting with the, with the slideshow. And this is the physics engine. So um, those are shapes and those are shape effects. Uh, yeah, depending on where you put your, your objects there, then either both shapes end up in the bucket or just one shape. Right, and that was the demonstration. That was the lessons learned, the experience. Um, thanks for attention. Uh, the, the hope is that indeed um, that, that triggers, like from all of us, including myself, that triggers some, um, some, some cleanup action. And um, again, the, if you manage to go past those initial hurdles, it's just a wonderful world of possibilities, as you see, what is possible there. It's just a shame that we will probably lose many interested people, both uh, people who might have a commercial interest and then throw it away because after two days, uh, nothing is done yet, um, but in particular volunteers or students or other people interested in hacking your office. Okay, that was that. Are there any questions? Okay, then thanks again and um Yeah, so, so the question, if I understood you correctly, is like, can we change the, the API or how easily can we change the API or should we change? Does it actually happen? So have frozen. Yeah. So, so yes, it happens, but um, um, reluctantly. So, so when you change, so, so there's corners of the API that very likely nobody use, use it. Either it's not documented or it's been broken for many years, so it couldn't have possibly been used. And then there's no harm cleaning that up or changing that. But there's obviously the, the other side of the coin is that there's API that is very, very, very frequently used. And if you change it, you break external people, like you, you break external software. And, and we, since we have no control as a project about the, the release cycle and whether the, the engineer is even still around to fix that basic macro or to fix that extension, uh, that's quite a disruptive move. And as a project, I think we are well advised, we're very careful. If we do that, we should have extremely good reasons. There's no, there's no hard and fast rule. Um, but in general, there's checks and balances in place that if some change, breaking change comes in on published API, uh, that some alarm bell go goes off and Stefan is, uh, uh, you have Stefan in your back. Um, and, and I think that's just a good thing because like, like just the same like, like Linux kernel or Windows uh, API changes if ever then just very slowly. 
And at the same time, people are just extremely upset about Apple constantly changing their, their API because it imposes a real cost. And if you're an open source project, probably the, the downstream cost of your change cannot be absorbed because it's, it's volunteer time or it doesn't happen at all. So um, I, I'm, I would always advocate to be very careful. What's in? Uh, yes, so uh, one thing that I would say uh, that uh, if, they, uh, if with, uh, with the uh, extension with uh, C++ right? Yeah, so I remember uh, the with C++ extensions and uh, you said that it's not that same, but now it's the uh, reverse. So I'm, now I'm working for five extensions and you're uh, actually uh, we in C++ extensions. So let me ask this way. So could you do that in Python probably? Um, so, so the choice for C++ was due to the fact that it was a hardware project. So, so there, was a, there was this shared memory driver interface that necessarily would have been some, some C or C++ language. So, so that would have just added complexity then to kind of wrap that in, in C and then have a Python binding for that and then use that in, Py in Python. So for that project, the quickest way was actually, so we thought, uh, to go with uh, C++. The, the challenge was, of course, to get it to work, like the, 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 the trivial things, like just getting uh, the examples to compile. Um, but yeah, and, and I think but it, it was educational in a way that this kind of re-running uh, this uh, or speed running this experience and then finding your, your blog posts there and then realizing that it's all, all there. It's just, a, um, it's just a bit confusing. So that, that's, that's essentially the, the, uh, the message here, that, um, that everything is there. Uh, it just needs this, this, this last mile, this, this, this last step of polishing and cleaning up and removing the, the misleading stuff and the duplicated stuff. And uh, do you have so, so we don't use CMake, um, but um, beyond what is the, the proprietary bit there, we can certainly share that. Although I believe that there's not much. So I think the the Impress, um, let's say the uh, how to interact with Impress there, that can certainly be shared um, if if that is of value, like. Or maybe we should just share it with you, and then you have that as some exercise uh, solution. <laughs> um, I'm interested, let's say, uh, some examples, uh, some, let's say, skeleton, uh, uh, skeleton uh, extensions in C++, and, uh, for example, generates um, out of the binary for different platforms and packages. So there are some uh, things <laughs> Yeah, we can absolutely share that. Let's maybe sit down when 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 you're done with the workshop. I don't know. Um, can be can be after the conference whenever it works for you. Um, so so it's it's one of those. I mean, it's it's a demo, so don't expect uh, well documented and and clean code. There's so certainly a little bit of work, but let's just sit down, go through that, see what is of value there. No problem at all. Happy to to share that. Thank you. Okay, should we wrap it up? Then, thanks again. Enjoy the conference.